Hi everyone, I'm Lance Telfeathers and welcome to the first ever Buffalo Journal. Join me for the next half hour for the news and views of Canada's native people. Today the Buffalo Journal takes you to the Kainai Powwow and Rodeo in Standoff, Alberta, an annual event that attracts hundreds of visitors each summer. Also on today's show we will be traveling to Pincher Creek, Alberta for the Indian Summer World Film Festival, one of the few festivals of its kind in the world. And as part of the coverage of that festival, we will be looking closely at the premiere of Where the Spirit Lives, the tragic story of Indian residential schools. But first, we take you to the Kainai Powwow and Rodeo. Every summer, many of Canada's native people gather for at least four days to celebrate their rich and colorful culture. The powwow, which is a modern encampment, brings together many different tribes in a friendly reunion of friends, relatives and visitors. These celebrations are usually held during the months of June, July and August on various Indian reserves and native communities across North America. This past summer, the Buffalo Journal visited the Blood Indians at Standoff, Alberta and experienced some of the rich and colorful heritage of the contemporary native people at their four-day powwow and rodeo. The air was electric with the energy of the drums and bells. Standoff is a community about 60 kilometers west of Lethbridge, near the Belly Buttes, the traditional hunting territory of the Bloods for centuries. Each summer, more than 10,000 people from near and far attend the Bloods powwow. Although there are many attractions to see and hear throughout the duration of the gathering, the main event was no doubt the songs and dance of the traditional Indian culture. The grand entry marks the opening of each day's performance. The flag is carried by war veterans, symbolizing Indian warriors. The owl dance is one of the more ancient Blackfoot social dances, similar to a waltz. It's ladies' choice. It's been said, when the owls dance, it's time for romance. The round dance is another common social dance. The circular movement symbolizes the circular movements of life. This is the men's traditional dance, a popular dance at the powwow. The traditional dance was adopted from the Sioux Indians over a century ago. The costumes of the traditional dancers is a show of artistic refinement. Note the number tags on each dancer. They are contestants in the traditional dance competition. Prize money is paid out to the best in each category. The drums are the heartbeat of the powwow, symbolic of the beat in every person's heart. The songs are unique to the North American Aboriginal people and are often passed down to the coming generations. 
Many Indians travel throughout the country going from one reservation to another. When the powwow gets into your blood, it's hard to get it out. So uh, where are you from and what brings you out here to uh, stand off? Well, originally I'm from uh, Isleta, Texas and um, I'm currently uh, living in, in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, one of the reasons I come down here is um, besides just getting away from Alaska for the winter is uh, I like to powwow and I know some people around this area and um, it's a good place. People are really good to me here and enjoy dancing coming around. Steve Wesley from Morley. Sit up there Steve. Come on. Make a ride looking good. Get the points cowboy. The whistle goes. You can get off any time now. Good ride for Steve Wesley. The excitement of the rodeo is also part of the Bloods annual festival. Kainai Rodeo Days is one of the bigger rodeos of the summer season, attracting talent from all over the North American continent. These cowboys and cowgirls are here to take a shot at being rodeo stars and perhaps making it pay off. The Bloods have put up $5,000 in prize money and this has attracted the best in the sport of Indian rodeo. Today, they're riding high. Fresh look and get out there. Makes the eight second whistle. John Shade moves in, pick him up, puts him down on the ground. How about that? Woo Pat Hall. One of the top competitors in the Indian Rodeo Cowboys Association is Pat Hall from Browning, Montana. He's representing the Blackfeet Nation here at this rodeo. Hall ranks as one of the best bronc riders traveling the rodeo trail. His inspiration comes from years of experience with horses. Yeah. You keep coming back to standoff every year. What brings you back here? Oh, just I've always had really good luck here, good horses, and uh, a lot of money up and stuff. That's the reason to go to them for the money and get on good broncs. Now you're a saddle bronc rider. That seems awful dangerous. Why would you do something like that? Well, I just kind of growed up on a ranch breaking horses and colts and uh, all my cousins and brothers and stuff like that all did it and it just kind of come natural. I just learned from them. When the dance is over and the last eagle feather has been neatly tucked away, the powwow traveler will hit the road for the next powwow maybe hundreds of miles away. The Bloods treated their guests good. Maybe next year they will be back to try that one brunk that threw them or to dance that last round dance again. When the Buffalo Journal returns, Aboriginal movies It is not very often that movies about native people make big news. But it was big news at this year's Indian Summer World Festival of Aboriginal Motion Pictures. The festival, hosted by the Pincher Creek Film Society, brought moviegoers from near and far to watch the latest in Aboriginal films. Probably the only festival of its kind anywhere in the world, this year's gala event was one of the most successful ever hosted by the Society. The Pagan Indians also played a part in the event. As co-hosts, certainly the Blackfoot culture played a big part in the festival. The theme of the Aboriginal Film Festival was sharing, and indeed there was an intercultural exchange. 
The Buffalo Journal's Hank Shade spoke to the festival coordinator. Well, uh, this festival allows Aboriginal motion picture producers all around the world to gather and discuss things with each other. It's the only opportunity that they have. The festival is unique. It's the only one in the world. So our objectives are to bring people together like that and, uh, and give them an opportunity to talk to each other, discuss things with each other, maybe share ideas. The theme of the festival is sharing. And our long-term objectives are to, uh, to take this festival and make it into, uh, hopefully, a society that can do this on a year-round basis and have, have something like a screening, the film festival, to be the highlight of the year. But it would, uh, it would be the only opportunity that native producers have to have an organization that would be strong for them, that, uh, that they could feel some solidity for. What type of delegates have you attracted? Where are they from and uh, what caliber of producers? Do you have here? We have, uh, we have people from several countries this year. We have uh, representation from uh, the Soviet Union in Siberia, the Chukchi people. We have uh, people from Scandinavia who represent the Sami nation. Other people from, uh, from Denmark, New Zealand, Australia, all throughout North America. And uh, this is our third year, and it, it's now by word of mouth getting around to people uh, throughout the world that, that this festival exists and there's more interest this year has probably really uh, really shown the most interest. The, the people that are here this year hadn't heard about us before and they're going back home to tell their groups and, and uh, organizations about us. So I expect that next year's even going to be a, a stronger contingent from around the world. And I would like every one of you to share with me where you are. Pray. You are supporting me and you are supporting my native people. Among the festival organizers were elders and spiritual leaders from the Blackfoot, Sarsi, and Salish nations. The native cultural activities were coordinated by pagan spiritual leader Reggie Croshu. And traditionally we looked at how we started putting camps together and one of the ways you'd put a camp together for events uh, historically would probably be getting the a society to come in and help. And in our case with the pagan, the um, Brave Dog Society were society that were brought in for any time there's going to be a camp gathering. And for the film festival, we invited the Brave Dog, to, Brave Dog Society to be a large part of the film festival. So they're helping to look after security in camp, uh, the wood for the camp, basic setup for the camp, the opening ceremonies, they're a large part of that. And we hope that they're a large part of the uh, powwow too on uh, Saturday night. Some of the cultural activities included an Indian encampment with traditional teepees that were open for inspection and a daily powwow for curious visitors. The Aboriginal Film Festival also provided some practical information for serious movie makers. A number of workshops were conducted on screenwriting and acting. Some of the more prominent workshop presenters were BC actor Leonard George, the son of the late screen star Chief Dan George. And if you don't express it in some way, it builds up just the same as knowledge does. Also from BC was native actress Margot Kane, whose latest project is a movie, Pow Wow Highway. Wake up, we have to do this. This is very important. Our society is not made up of white actors. It's made up of brown and red and yellow. And there are people, just people working in. As well as bringing movie makers to Pincher Creek, the festival gave the general public a peek at what's happening in the movie world and information on the latest Aboriginal films. When the Buffalo Journal returns, where the spirit lives. Among the many films that were screened at the Aboriginal Film Festival 
one received critical acclaim from the moviegoers. Where the Spirit Lives, a film about Indian residential schools in 1937, is a sensitive story about a young Blackfoot girl, Comey, who was forcefully taken from her camp and put into an Indian residential school. Talking gobbledygook. <whistles> Sir! Sir! Peter! Mommy! All ties with her people were cut off, and she was forced to learn the ways of the white world. The story of Indian residential schools is a controversial one, and has been described by some critics as the Canadian Holocaust a page of history most Canadians don't want to remember. You'll get more of the same if you won't learn civilized behavior. Vita! Vita! You learn to take your punishment like get a man. Too? Savage, You'll be all right. Boy, you. Come here. Come here, savage. The story is based on the experience of many native people who, like Comey, were forced to attend the church-run boarding schools from the turn of the century to the early 1980s. When Comey arrives at the school, she is treated like a savage. And when she refuses to conform to the strict rules of her new home, she is caged like an animal. Good morning, class. I'm your new teacher, Miss Gwillenberry. I hope we shall all be good friends. The two-hour drama chronicles the struggle made by Indian students to survive the transition from the old way of life to the new, where modern beliefs meant losing the old culture. Although the story is a fiction tale, it has chilling realism. The lead role was played by Mohawk actress Michelle St. John. No. Eat. Bush in it. Rick Tailfeathers spoke to her recently. How did you react to, to the story? Um, well, I knew a little bit. I, I mean, I had heard about residential schools when I first was um, being interviewed for the part. and. But I, I didn't really, I hadn't done any research at that point. When, as I started doing research, I found some things that just blew my mind, you know, the way the, the government's attitude, the church's attitude towards Native people. It, it's so obvious what the underlying message was, and that was just to simply um, end the Indian problem. <laughs> and um, I, it blows my mind in, in this country, in the United States of America, you know, everybody talks about wars in Europe and America's got their hands and everything all over the place but the people forget that it happened here. The movie was shot on location on the Blood Indian Reserve at the old St. Paul's School. Indoor segments were filmed in Toronto. For some people watching the film was almost like going back home to the boarding schools. It brought back bitter memories for many. with you, you stupid little heathen! Eyes front! About! Face! Ready! March! Left! Left! Right! Left! Right! Chin up! The Buffalo Journal's Lance Tailfeathers got some of their comments after the movie. For me, it has been uh, just like coming back home to residential schools that's where i was raised and uh 
stayed about 16 years in those residences, so there's nothing new to me on some of the things that I've seen. The story was right to the point, and I hope everybody in Canada, United States, and the world see this movie. It was, but it was really, really good. I think it hit home base for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it really gave me an insight into the residential school, how it affected a lot of the natives in the beginning, and how it's affecting us to this day. And you? I enjoyed the movie. It was quite moving. Um, it was really interesting too. And um, even though I haven't been to a residential school, I heard a lot of stories about it too from my brothers and sisters too. It hit home. I'm just glad that uh, it's coming up, so that sometimes some of our problems stem from there, and our children will be able to know what we had went through. The one message it brings to society is that hopefully they'll realize that that was the way things were mm -hmm. in them days and I find I find it a very as I said a very good eye-opener I think that it will teach the Canadian public about a segment of Canadian history that the majority of people don't know about although Canadian and British release of the movie where the spirit lives is limited to television a theatrical release in the U.S. is in the negotiation stages. Each month we will be asking you, the viewers, a short question on these subjects, Indian history, culture and personalities. In 1877 a historic event happened somewhere in Western Canada. This event, known as the signing of Treaty Number no. 7, altered the course of history for Indian tribes in the area. The question is, which tribe signed this historic treaty and where? The Buffalo Journal invites you, the audience, to make comments about the program. Address your letters to us at the Buffalo Journal, P.O. Box 1120, Lethbridge, Alberta, T1J4A4. That's the program for today. We hope that you have enjoyed it. On our next program, we meet a weekend warrior. We'll also be taking you to the ancient remains of a buffalo jump here in southern Alberta. Hank Shade will also be joining me. Until then, so long. The Buffalo Journal is a program produced by the native people of Western Canada. It looks at the culture, history and contemporary lifestyles of Canada's Aboriginal people.